Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the math portion of GMAT. We have been solving math problems out of this prop book here, the GMAT official guide 2021. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today, we will solve some multiple choice problems that you will find on page number 210, beginning with 333. At the end of the video, if you find this helpful and if you decide that you would like to work with me, that you would like to hire me as a tutor to get you ready for the exam, you can reach me at kashwaniprep at icloud.com. Let's take a look at the very first problem on the page number 333. Make sure the book is in front of you. This is what we are told. We are told that we are going to buy some desks and some tables. We are going to pay $35 for each desk and we are going to buy X number of desk. We're going to pay $30 for the tables, we're going to buy Y tables. The question is very straightforward, very simple. The question is how much did we spend all together? What did we pay all together? Total amount spent. State number one tells us that we paid state number one tells us we paid $900 for Y tables. We spent $900 for Y tables and we know tables cost $30. So essentially what this tells us is that 900 divided by 30, what this tells us is that we bought 30 tables. That's all it tells us. Which is good, we bought 30 tables even though we didn't need to know because we're not interested in how many we bought, we just want to know how much money we spent. But the problem here is that we know how much we spent on table, this does not tell us at all as to how many desks we bought. Until we know how many desks we bought, we cannot figure out the total amount spent. Statement 1 by itself is not enough. A D. B, C, E. Statement 1 by itself is not enough. The answer cannot be A, O, D. Let's look at second statement. The second statement tells us, second statement tells us that X is 90. Ah, there you go, X is 90, which means we bought 90 desks. They also go on to tell us that for desk, for desk, we paid three and a half times Three and a half times the amount paid for Y tables. Three and a half times the amount that we spend on Y tables. Let's see what we can do with it. We can set up an equation, obviously. Okay. So for the desk, how much did we pay for the desk? We pay. We paid desk. We pay $35, we pay $35 for desk, for each desk, and they tell us how many we bought. They tell us, we bought 90 of them. So this is the desk. And how much did we spend on table? They tell us how much we spent on table. We spent three and a half times the amount that we spent, the amount of money that we spent on the desk. The amount of money that we spent on the desk is three and a half times the amount that we spent on tables. We bought white tables at at thirty dollars each. There you go. I'm going to erase this part here because three and a half times the amount. Very good idea. Three and a half times, three and a half times the ta money that we spend on tables. There you go. As you can clearly see here, okay, we're going to make it very quick. As we can clearly see, we can solve for y, and y represents the amount, number of tables. Listen very carefully. So this will tell you how many tables we bought. This will tell you how many tables we bought. We know how much we paid for each table. They tell us how many desks we bought, and we know how, how much we paid for each desk. Okay, one more time. We know the price of desk. They tell us how many desks we bought. This will tell us how many how many tables we bought, and they tell us how much each table costs. All together, this is enough. The second statement by is enough. The answer is B. That's all. As far as the real exam is concerned, we are done. We don't have to do any more work at here at all. Do you understand? Anything that we're going to do right now is just for learning purposes, not something you want to do real exam, because to do what we are about to do in the real exam, to do what we are about to do in the real exam would be a sheer waste of time. We're going to set up an equation and solve for it. It's very simple. Actually, the equation is right here. We don't have to set up anything. This equation is right here. So y equals, this equation tells us that y equals 35 times 90, 35 times 90 over 3.5 times 30. There you go. 35 divided by 3.5 is 10, and 30, 90 divided by 30 is 3. As you can see, 10, 10 times 3, y equals 30. Which makes sense, because from the first statement, 
we extracted the information that y equals 30. They should never conflict. If you do one statement and you find out y equals 30 and some other, and the first statement told you that y equals 40, something has gone wrong. They always agree with each other. If the first statement told you, based on what, is, what we were told in the first statement, we arrived at the conclusion that we bought 30 tables, then the second statement, if the work is done properly, should also tell us that we bought 30 tables. We bought 30 tables, we know the price of tables, they tell us how many desks we bought, we know the price of the desk. Of course we can figure out how much money we spent. Number 34. Number 34. 334. We have three kids, we are told. We have three kids. And they're going to inherit. They inherited total of X dollars. We are told that the youngest one, or rather the eldest one, the eldest one got 7,000 more than the youngest one. We are further told that the youngest one got $9,000 less, $9,000 less than the middle one. Again, the eldest the middle one and the youngest one. Eldest, E represents the amount of money that the eldest one got, M represents the amount of money that the middle one got, and Y of course will represent the amount of money that the youngest one got. The question simply is, how much did they get all together? What was the total inheritance? What was the total inheritance? Let's see what they tell us. Well, before we figure out what they tell us, Let's, 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 let's work on this little we, we are told a lot, we are given a lot of information, let's work on it. So here we have the eldest, here we have the middle, and here we have the youngest. Eldest one we know got 7,000 more than the youngest one. The youngest one got Y dollars, which means eldest one must have gotten E minus 7. E represents the number, amount of dollars the eldest one got in thousands. E minus 7, because he got 7,000 less than the youngest one got. And the middle one we are told, not E minus 7, rather, and this one got 7,000 more, and this one got 7,000 more than the youngest one. I'm not paying attention. And this one got, and this one got 7,000 more than the youngest one. The youngest one got Y dollars. And the middle one got 9,000 less than the youngest one got. Youngest one got 9,000 less than the middle one. Youngest one got 9,000 less than the middle one. So why don't we set it up as the middle one? Let's put this, let's put this guy in the middle one. The youngest one got 9,000 less than that, so he got 9,000 less than the middle one. There we go. And now we'll work on this part. And, uh, and the eldest one, we told, is 7,000 more than the youngest one. 7,000 more than the youngest one. And the youngest one is m minus 9. Let's put it in here. The youngest one is m minus 9. So m minus 9, which is the youngest one, plus the 7. This is what the, he got. The point here is that as soon as we, as, as, as we can, if we can figure out what one of these people got, we can see solve for all, their, all the other three because they're all related. We have to just know how much, how much one of those three kids got. If we know the amount of money that one of them got, we can figure out the total amount. That's the point here. Let's see what this statement one tells us. What I did here just now, I would not have done in a real exam because it really doesn't matter how they're set up. What we have to understand is that they're all related. If you know the value of one, we can figure out all the other because one thousand. If one guy got this, if, what if, if you know this guy, this guy got nine thousand less, and this guy got seven thousand more than this guy, or rather that guy. You get the idea. What they tell you? There you go. Statement one tells us that m equals twenty-seven. There you go. If m equals twenty-seven, you can figure out the total. Do you understand? Statement one by itself is enough. A D B C E. Statement one by itself is enough. The answer cannot be. A, D, B, C, E. Answer cannot be B, C, or E. It will have to be either A or D. Second statement tells us. Second statement tells us that. Uh, second statement tells us that uh, youngest child 
and the middle child together inherited 45,000. The youngest in the middle, the second statement tells us the youngest in the middle inherited 45,000. And the youngest we know inherited 9,000 less. The youngest we know inherited at least $9,000 less than the middle one. There we go. All you have to solve, all we have to do is solve for M and we solved a little while ago. We put the value of M and we figure out the total. Let's see what the, this is gives us 2M equals 45 plus 9 would be 54 and M equals 27. There you go. M equals 27. Of course M equals 26 because that's exactly what the first statement told us. They should not conflict. If they conflict then something has gone wrong. Once we know how much the middle one got, we can figure out the, all the others. Which means the second statement by itself is also enough. The answer is D. Second statement by itself is also enough. 335 335 335 tells us that x times y times z cannot equal to 0 and the question is how much is x raised to 4 times z squared over z squared times y squared z squared times y squared if I read it correctly there you go exactly question is how much is this essentially what they're asking us because this is z squared this is z squared essentially what they're asking us how much is x raised to 4 over y squared that's what we have to answer let's see what the first statement tells us so first statement tells us that y squared equals x to the 4 oh there you go if y squared equals x to the 4, y squared equals x to the 4, these two quantities are equal to each other. This quantity equals to 1. This quantity equals to 1, based on the first statement. Very simply, we don't have to do anything. The first statement by itself, A, D, B, C, E, the first statement by itself is quite enough. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us, second statement, oh, there you go, second statement is, second statement is even sillier. They tell you what x is and what y is. Well, if you know what x is, and we, if you know y is, you put it in here. It's simply x is 2, 2 raised to 4, and y is 4, 4 raised to 2, of course, is 1, just like before. As I told you before, they should not, they should not give us conflicting information. Second statement by itself is also enough, the answer is D. The two statements should never give us conflicting information, because otherwise something has gone wrong. The answer is D. This was too silly. Number 336. 336. If they are too silly, that's actually good for us. That means they are gifts. They are too easy, too simple. Number 336 says that A and B are integers. Are integers. And they, told us, and they further tell us that B is positive. B is positive. Which is a very, bit of, very important bit of information. We'll see it in a second. The question is, does a minus 1 over b plus 1 equal a over b? Equal a over b. Now because they tell us b is positive, because they tell us b is positive, we're just going to cross multiply here. Actually, we didn't, didn't even have to tell us that part. We could have done it either way because it's not an inequality. I'm not thinking. Let's cross multiply before we look at, the, before we look at the, what is given to us. This is, this is the question here, but we're not going to answer it in this form. We're going to simplify it. Let's cross multiply. So b times a minus 1 equals a times b plus 1. So let's just see what happens. So we get ab minus b, ab minus b equals ab plus a. a and b will cancel out. The question, what boils down to is, does minus b equal a? That's what we want to find out. Does minus b, does negative b equal a? This is what we have to answer. This is what we have to answer because that's what that boils down to. Let's look at the, let's look at what is given to us. Before we worry about anything else, let's first analyze what is given to us first. Minus b equals a. And if you look at the two statements carefully, listen very carefully, if you look at the two statements carefully, a statement 2, statement 2 clearly tells us that a equals minus b. 
statement 2, not 1, statement 2 clearly tells us that a equals minus b which means statement 2 by itself is enough the question is does minus b equal a? they tell us it does which means second statement by itself is enough because what they're asking us is what they're telling us second statement by itself is enough so pay attention here, this is very tricky but pay attention always we write down a, b, b, c, e that should be your habit but every once in a while if what they are asking us is clearly, very clearly stated in the second statement without doing any work at all, if you can clearly see the second statement gives us what we need, second statement clearly answers the question, then we start with that, it's easier. But if you can start with second statement first, always get in the habit of writing this, but immediately, because we are starting with second statement, immediately switch them. B comes here and A comes here. And now, since second statement by itself is enough, the answer cannot be A, C or E, it will have to be either B or D. Do you understand? Let's look at the first statement. Let's look at the first statement. The first statement tells us that a equals b minus 4. a equals b minus 4. Just I'm going to make sure I read it. There you go. a equals b minus 4. The problem here is that it, it relates a to positive b. Listen very carefully. It relates a to positive b. We're not interested in how a relates to positive b. We want to figure out how a relates to negative b. We need to see how a relates to negative b. So somehow we have to introduce, we have to force it, we have to introduce by force a negative b in it. That's exactly what we're going to do. So watch what happens. Let's, let's, uh, let's write down a equals to negative b plus the b minus 4 which is what's given to us, this part was given to us and then since we since we did uh, negative b here we have to get rid of it by introducing positive b. So the negative b will cancel out the positive b and now we introduce negative b in it so that we can compare a to negative b. Are you with me? So this tells us that a equals negative b plus a b and a b to b minus 4. There we go. So now the answer is very straightforward. Does a equal ne negative b? The answer is, does a equal negative b? The answer is yes it will. Yes it will as long as, as long as this quantity 2b minus 4 equals 0. As long as this quantity drops out, if 2b minus 4 is 0, then a would equal negative b. In order for this quantity to be 0, b needs to be 2. And we have no way of knowing if b is indeed 2. Second statement tells us nothing at all, there is nothing in second statement that assures us that b equals 2. Because we do not know whether or not b equals 2, second statement does not do the job. The answer is b. Oh, I keep saying second statement, this is first statement. Answer is b, which is why we crossed them out, or my answer, which is exactly why I crossed them out. Because otherwise I was about to pick a, but I would not have picked a because I crossed it out. I, I put a over there, just to remind us. And we put a over there, b over there, we crossed them out right away. This is, this is the point. The answer is b here, which means that the second statement by itself is enough. Second statement by itself is of course enough because they tell us exactly what they're asking us. But the first statement is not enough because we have no way of knowing what B is. 337. 337. Let's see what it tells us. 337 says In a sequence, in a sequence, each number, each term rather, each term is two more than the preceding one, than the preceding one. The question simply is, what's the fourth term. What's the fourth term? Let's see what they tell us in statement one. Statement one tells us that the last term, last term is 90. The last term is 90. The only way we can figure out, the only way we can figure out what the fourth term is, if we know how many terms there are. If we know how many terms there are, we can work backwards and figure out what the fourth term is. But we have no way of knowing how many terms there are in the sequence. 
So simply knowing the last one is 90 does not tell us what the fourth one is. The first statement by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. First statement by itself is not enough. The answer cannot be A or D. It will have to be either B, C or E. The second statement, second statement tells us that the first term, well there we go, first term, first term is 2. Well this is too silly. If the first term is 2, of course we can figure out the fourth term. Because each term is 2 more than the preceding term. The first one is 2, the next one is 4, four 6 and 8. There you go. Second statement does the job nicely. The answer is B. Answer is B because second term does the, does the job nicely. 338, the last one. Three hundred and thirty-eight. Three hundred and thirty-eight says that, or rather, doesn't say anything. It's asking us: Is P divisible by five? Is P divisible by five? In other words, is P a multiple of five? If it's multiple of five, we can divide it by five. First statement tells us. First statement tells us that P is divisible by 10. There you go. If P is divisible by 10, then obviously 10 is nothing more than 5 times 2. Those are the prime factors of 10. If P is divisible by 10, P must be divisible by 5 and 2. First statement is does the job. A, D, B, C, E. First statement does the job very nicely. Once it cannot be B, C, or E, it would have to be either A or a D. Of course, if something is a multiple of 10, it has to be divisible by 5. Second statement tells us, second statement tells us that P is not divisible by 15. P is not divisible by 15. So, if P is not divisible by 15, can we answer the question whether or not it is divisible by 5? The answer is no. It depends on what P is. For example, P is not divisible by 15, maybe if P is 20. Or maybe P is 10. In which case, the answer is yes. It is divisible by 5. It says P is not divisible by 15, maybe P is 21. Or 11. Or 17. Could be anything. In which case, it is not divisible by 5. Second statement does not do the job. The answer here is, the answer here is A. Only the first statement by itself does the job. That was the end of the first column on that page, number, page number 211. We'll meet tomorrow again, as usual, and we'll work on some multiple choice problems. As I said in the beginning of the video, if you wish to get hold of me, you can reach me at kishwaniprep at icloud.com. Alright, bye now.